Hi, and welcome to Inside Science Conversations. I'm your host, Chris Gorski. I'm the senior editor at InsideScience.org, a website produced by the American Institute of Physics. Today, we're talking to Lindy Elkins Tanton. She's a planetary geologist, a professor at Arizona State University, and the principal investigator of NASA's Psyche mission, which is scheduled to launch in summer 2022. Uh, Lindy, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me. This is a pleasure, Chris. So I try to start the show with a question. When you were 10 or 12 years old, what did you think you were going to do <laughs> as a career, as, I don't know, an adventure? What, what did you have in mind? Yeah, it was a classic question. And I guess I get asked all the time, like, when did you know that you wanted to study planets or work with NASA or something? And when I was 10 or 12, I wanted to be veterinarian. And I spent all my time with horses and dogs. And um, it wasn't until years later when I realized that all my horses and dogs hated the veterinarian that I no longer wanted to be a veterinarian. <laughs> so, so, so what brought you to planets? They, I guess they don't really respond in the same way. Yeah, you can feel warmly toward them and it's all good. Uh, <laughs> I was always interested just in all kinds of natural science, but also with art and music and literature, the ways that humans contend with what's around us to try to understand it and interpret it. And I ended up going into geology, uh, mostly working on terrestrial geology for a while. And then I became fascinated during my PhD with the concept of the magma ocean, which it seems to be that probably several times during their formation, the formation of the rocky terrestrial planets, they had giant accretionary impacts with other objects as they were growing that had so much energy that they actually melted the planet entirely. And that is a magma ocean. So the idea that you would have the Earth or Venus or Mercury or Mars out there in space literally a liquid ball of magma that is about to solidify, cool and solidify into a planet. That felt so poetic and primal to me and also is a great starting point for forward models. And so that's where I really got into planetary science. So how did you, I mean, I mean, that's something that, you know, I majored in geology in school. I don't think we really got into that in undergrad curriculum or, you know, maybe just a touch, right? So, so how do you, how did you kind of move through school to get there? Yeah, in my undergrad, I, I did study a little bit of planets, but mostly just geology. And I did a master's in geochemistry studying feldspars. And uh, then I went to work in business. Um, and I worked in business for eight years. I left academia, learned so much. And then I taught math for two years. And then I went back for my PhD when I was 31. And it was during my PhD when I was doing high temperature and pressure experiments in the lab with, uh, with my primary advisor, Professor Tim Grove. And we started working on some lunar analogs to understand the volcanoes that happened on the moon three and a half billion years ago. So when you look up at the moon and you see those great big craters filled with dark, dark rock, the black craters, that's of course basalt. It's a volcanic rock. It's the most basalt you can see anywhere in the solar system. It's a huge, huge volume of basalt. And we wanted to understand how it formed inside the moon. And that's the pathway that I took to learning about magma oceans and eventually doing the modeling that then brought me to think about the early stages of planetary formation with the little planetesimals, the little planets that accreted together to make the big planets. And finally, that's what led to the Psyche mission because we think Psyche the asteroid psyche out in the asteroid belt is uh, a piece of one of those planetesimals, the very first little bodies in our solar system. The asteroid belt is millions of miles away, right? How, how, how do you know, or how do you, how do you, why do you suspect that it's part of a ancient planetesimal? Well, we do think actually that all the asteroids are parts of ancient planetesimals. And most of them are just tiny collisional fragments that have been broken apart. But a few of them, the bigger ones, might be most of, or even all of a planetesimal like Ceres and Vesta. And we think Psyche is probably a big part of a planetesimal. So dynamically, when you think about how the planets formed and how they moved, the asteroid belt is just um, perched there, protected by the gravity of Jupiter from uh, moving away or being interfered with by other planets or ever having accreted into a planet. So it's just the leftovers that is that it's there because it's protected by Jupiter. So we get to look at the asteroid belt and effectively look back in time. 
So we look at the reflected light spectra off of the asteroids. We look at how radar bounces off them, all the things we've learned from missions already. And that tells us a lot about what they're made of. And so you're the principal investigator of this mission. What, what does that mean? What, what, are your, what do you have to do? So principal investigator means that I'm the person who's been leading this effort. We started in 2011 with our idea for the Psyche mission, and we started writing our proposal and putting together our team and teaming up with Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And by the time 2014 came along, and we've been working on it for three years, uh, it was time to submit our first proposal. The team was about 50 people. Proposal was about 250 pages and 28 proposals competed and five were selected to go on to step two. And we were selected, which was <laughs> like, when I got that phone call, I still can't believe it because we did not expect to be selected. We thought we were the underdog for a million reasons. And uh, so we and our team went on to step two. That's um, almost a thousand page report, a full year. The first time we get funded, get some money to do it. And our team grew to about 150. And then in 2017, just a, oh my gosh, it's five years and six days since the day that NASA called to say that we are selected for flight. And so as principal investigator, my job was to try to help put that team together, create those coalitions, do the strategy, help to write the proposal, um, manage the team's relations with NASA headquarters, and going forward, all those jobs continue. So, so far it's administration, strategy, budgeting, scheduling, all of that stuff that we're not taught how to do as scientists. And eventually it becomes about science again. I mean, if it's scheduled to launch this summer, I mean, are you kind of holding your breath and working frantically for the next six months? Is that? Yes, yeah. So this is, um, oh my gosh, it's hard to even express how intense it is right now. <laughs> you, you know, so at the end of April, beginning of May, we're meant to ship the spacecraft from Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena to Florida so it can get integrated with its rocket, which is a SpaceX Falcon Heavy, and get ready for our launch period, which opens on August 1st. So if everything goes beautifully, we're going to launch on August 1st. But of course, first of all, we're building a spacecraft. Um, and the team has been as large as 800 people. It's a big endeavor. Uh, and uh, dozens of subcontractors. The spacecraft itself is, uh, when, when its solar arrays are unfolded, it's gonna be the size of a single tennis court. It's a big undertaking. Doing it under any circumstances is difficult. Doing it under COVID is very difficult because you cannot build a spacecraft remotely through Zoom, sadly. So fortunately we have a fantastic team and people have really largely been able to keep their morale up and keep driving forward and staying safe. And I think that we're gonna make it, but we have a million challenges like spacecraft always do at this stage. And so um, you know, people told me that doing a, a space mission is like, it's like a marathon that ends in a sprint. Only what I didn't understand is that the sprint is 12 months long. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's just a huge amount of um, trying to make sure that we all get rest and trying to celebrate our successes and help everyone on the team as much as possible. And that's where we are right now. Wow. That sounds like a lot. It is a lot. It's a lot. And it's so much fun. The spacecraft is going into the thermal vacuum chamber at Jet Propulsion Laboratory this week, which means that we've integrated almost all the subsystems onto the spacecraft and it's going into a chamber large enough to hold this whole spacecraft uh, that, and then to be evacuated to the vacuum of space and cooled down to the temperature of space to make sure the spacecraft works under those circumstances. So it's the, it's the, the second step in our environments testing to make sure that our spacecraft is really gonna work once it launches. That's where we are. Wow, well, well good luck. Thank you. <laughs> You know, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you was because of the essay you wrote in uh, Issues in Science and Technology that was published, I think, last summer. And you talked, you know, you're talking about 800 people working together towards some common goal that probably doesn't even count the, p the engineers who worked on the on the rocket that's going to launch it and all the other and a bunch of other people involved that's along right. the way, right? Yep. And what that really highlights is that the message of your essay that there are a lot of people involved and there's there are probably some different ways that we can manage 
science and the way we think about science. What brought you to think of a sort of hero model of science and some of the issues that it brings up? It's a huge passion of mine. And so the, the idea of this essay is that most of academic science, most of academia as a whole, operates under what we're calling the hero model, where the, where the single senior academician owns this pyramid of resources and ideas and people. So in the traditional, say, German uh, academic system, the hero model academic would be in charge of a building that includes a museum and a library and laboratories and a whole bunch of research uh, researchers and faculty and students all report in, entirely to this person. And this person is the intellectual owner of their topic at that university. That's the classic model, the classic hero model. And that is, you know, in modifications, how research academia generally works in the United States as well, uh, it, it, in some way or another. And the point that I'm trying to make in this essay is that there are a lot of problems with that model and that the model has brought us a long way in the millennium that it's been under use. And I, I'm not advocating that we throw it out altogether or that the people who are living in that model are bad people, like none of that. But I think we need to open the doors to some other ways to make progress. And the things that's really got me thinking about this, um, which I've been thinking about for a couple of decades, the first one is culture. Uh, a lot of us have noticed in academia, I think, that the culture is not always fabulous and that it can be, right? It can be the best ever. It can be filled with creative ideas and enthusiasm and coming to work can be such a pleasure. Or it can be a place where there's a lot of harassment and bullying and exclusion and where people shout each other down and where junior people uh, or unexpected voices are not listened to, you know, where the heroes own the concepts and will accept no contradictions. And that is not a positive model for people trying to join the field, for creating any kind of diversity or inclusion, because people who come in who are not in the standard model of the people in academia are not gonna feel welcomed by this or supported. It's very bad for diversity of ideas, it's bad for rapid progress. And so culture is the first thing that I started thinking about. How do you make a team where people get listened to and where new ideas are welcomed and where the person as they gain power in their seniority, use their power to help other people rather than to suppress them. So that was the first thing, culture, you know, and then I would just add incremental progress. The hero model generally means that people on their pyramids their pyramids are bumping up against their competitors' pyramids, and scientific progress tends to be made in little increment slivers of real estate around those mountains of knowledge. And you're not really encouraged to step into fields where you're not already the acknowledged expert. You can get completely attacked and creamed in your proposal reviews or your paper reviews or in, in uh, you know, conference uh, uh, conversations. And so kind of sticking to what you know best is rewarded vastly. And so that does not create giant leaps in innovation. And I would argue that in our world today, we need some giant leaps in innovation. We need people who are really asking the big critical questions and trying to solve the problems of our day in the most efficient way possible, not necessarily the way that will make them personally most famous. So that's what this essay is about. When you, ha when you have special specialties, a lot of the, and this is this what you mean by the pyramid where somebody learns more and more about less and less until they know basically everything about nothing. It, it reduces down almost that much. Yeah, that's, that's, um, that does happen, right? That's the giant joke is that in the end, you know, everything about nothing. Really what I mean by the pyramid is the ownership of resources and concepts. It's the ownership of ideas. And so, you know, one way that I can describe myself academically is as an igneous petrologist. So I study the rocks that are created by volcanoes. And so usually a university will only have one igneous petrologist or maybe two that are in really quite different ends of the field. And so I get to own my field. Um, that pyramid of concepts is mine. And uh, if anybody wants to work on it, really, they should come talk to me. And if anybody is saying, you know, saying stuff about igneous petrology, I get to weigh in with my expert voice and rule the day. And, uh, and I get to run my pyramid of people and resources the way I want with relatively little interference 
from the university often. Sometimes that's great. You can be the most amazing mentor ever and you can launch your students into fabulous careers and it can feel like a home almost, or it can be terrible. I can bully people and shut them down and I can bully them right out of the field if I don't like them or they're threatening me. And as I become more famous and my pyramid is larger, I get uh, a much higher rate of uh, approval of my, of my grant proposals. My papers go through review more easily. I get invited to do press interviews. I get to be an advisor. You know, these are the things that come with kind of fame, but the problem is a lot of it is driven by that sense of ownership and charisma and not as much as driven by excellence as should be. And so my question to all of us is, how can we be driven better by the outcomes, the importance of the work that you're doing, the ways that you're actually helping the community and building new people into STEM, and less by just, I know how to say things in a tone of voice that other people just say, yes, you're the expert. Like that is not actually a measure of excellence, but it's a way that we train ourselves. <laughs> right, right. So, I mean, you know, we see this with the Nobel Prizes where a couple of people are recognized for something that thousands of people have contributed to. I guess that's one of the largest, mo mo most glaring examples, you know, but it's, you know, this is a very ingrained pattern of thinking of, of here's how we manage things and here, who, here's who the experts are and here's how we get more knowledge. So how, what's a, what's the prospect for making this work, you know, in fields from, you know, agricultural science to NASA missions to, you know, uh, political science, right? Like, what can we do? What can we do? Yeah, uh, you know, I think a part of it is just thinking a little more critically about our culture instead of just um, blindly rewarding people who have that kind of stature and that way of delivering information. But then for the past five years, we've been working on an alternative model here at the Interplanetary Initiative at ASU. And we call our model the big questions model. And uh, it's a fairly risky thing to do in the beginning. And I just thought nobody was going to really go along with this concept. But I, I just, you know, here's an experiment. Why don't you all come and meet with me just for a few hours on this one day? We're going to serve snacks and we'll have coffee and we're going to do this thing. And uh, 50 people showed up. Everybody from deans and faculty, I invited everybody, staff, students, members of the community, some people from private sector. And I asked them, what are the questions that we need most urgently to answer in order to have a positive human space future? And we started writing down questions. What are the most important questions? I was looking for really aspirational questions. Like imagine the question is like you're javelin and you're throwing it way out over the hill and you're gonna to try to run and figure it out. Not the simple next step, not the little increment, but something that might take a career or a lifetime or several to actually answer. We collected these questions and then we voted on which are the most important. And one of the nice things that happened, even in that very first time, was that people who aren't really, quote, experts, like people who are not the hero model faculty, asked some of the most highly voted questions. Because it actually, it's an outside perspective can be fantastic. And we took the 10 most highly voted questions, and then I just invited people, go in the next room, sit at a table with the question you're most interested in, just volunteer into teams. And at the end of an hour, I'm going to ask somebody from each team to come up and give a little out brief. Here are the milestones we think we could reach in one year that would be in service of answering this question. Just the first steps. Here are the other disciplines we need at the table in order to start to answer those questions. And here's a little idea of the resources we might need. And so the, the discipline question I think is really important because many big important questions need lots of disciplines, but there's a big hierarchy of disciplines, how people value them. And I've seen this, for example, in capstone teams. The engineering student thinks that the student who does graphical design or marketing is a lesser expert than themselves. And then it turns out they can't do graphical design or marketing. And then they realize that person is super valuable and that everybody's there for a purpose and they actually can't reach the end goal without them. And that's a really lovely epiphany that I would like for everybody to have. <laughs> so that's what we do with these little teams. And so then what happens uh, is uh, we then pick a leader. So the goal is we're not coming in with one person and their idea. This is not the project designed around a person. This is a project designed around a question. 
So then we pick a leader, do some other things, give them professional project management, a little bit of seed funds, not much. And I and that was it, first year. We sent, we sent, we sent I don't know how many teams, some number of teams off to start their work. And it was in May and I thought, well, that's it, you know, four of them, I'm never gonna hear from them again. The fifth one will show up again in September. Turned out everybody loved it. They were into this idea of working on a team where everyone was going towards something they all believed in. We had our first peer review papers by September. None of the teams disbanded. So we've now done this with 25 different research projects. And the best metric, I think, of success is that we're running above a seven times return on investment. So we give a little bit of money and seed money, and then we encourage them to go get outside contracts, outside grants. And they've gotten more than seven times as much money back in in outside contracts and grants than we gave them in seed money. Wow. And so there's a model, the beginning of a model, an experiment that we've been running now for five years in how to put together teams around important questions instead of teams around charismatic leaders. I would like to suggest that both of these models can exist and many different hybrids and invented new models, um, not just the hero model. Wow, that would be really something. It's, it, it's uh, dizzying to think about trying to apply that to a lot of the ways that science funding are distributed, such as the National Science Foundation or the National Institutes of Health, et cetera, et cetera. Wouldn't that be I, fun? I, yeah. And does that come out of your experiences with NASA or, or, or a mix of all your experiences throughout your career? Yeah, a bunch of a mix of experiences. I, I really have been struck working on space missions, um, how much the different disciplines are valued and where you get away a bit from that hierarchy. Even though building the spacecraft, which is really the first thing that you think about for years and years, is really an engineering practice. The fact is that project management is the king. <laughs> <laughs> like that's how everything gets done. And the budgeters and the schedulers and the people who do social media and everyone is so valued and needed. And so that was a really lovely model for that. And then um, for a few years after I finished my master's and before I came back to science for my PhD, I worked as a management consultant. And I had a, a, an epiphany during, which everyone else is gonna think is total ignorance and naivete, but I'm gonna share it with you because to me it was life-changing. Um, we were working with um, Boeing Helicopter, actually, the company we were working with, and we were helping them figure out how to better manage their parts. They were taking in helicopters, disassembling them, reassembling them. And I was the junior member of the team and we were tracking what happened to all the parts and the paperwork and whether or not the inventory was being kept accurately and how we could help them do it better. And we gathered all this data. And then the senior members of the team said, we're going to suggest to Boeing that they do the following things and they reorganize their teams the following ways. Like they just made it up. And they're like, this would be better. We'll do this and this and this. And then I discovered that all you had to do was convince the other people that this was really how the world worked. And then it was true. It did work that way. Now that's not science, right? In science, you don't get to make it up in your head and then convince other people it's true. Like there has to be some fundamental physical truth to your science. But it turns out when you're working with humans, it's what we all agree upon reality is. That was the amazing kind of answer that I got out of that little lesson. And so that's been very inspiring to me and how to put together teams and think about how you can do your work. That if we all agree that this is reality, this is the world we live in, then it is. One of the other things related to this that I wanted to ask about was, was you know, your 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 essay begins with a anecdote about what I would say is about inbuilt assumptions about how the world works that people don't even realize are assumptions. And I wonder if you could explain a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. It was, um, I don't know when this was, maybe five, four or five years ago. And I was uh, the head of the School of Earth and Space Exploration, the director at the time at Arizona State University. A job that I um, stepped down from when Psyche was, was awarded because it's just too big a job to try to do it. But at the time when I was director of the school, we had our visiting committee and I was talking with them and feeling proud about the culture of the school. And I, when I came into the school at ASU, it already had a really good collaborative collegial culture, which makes it possible to have within one school, astrophysicists, geologists, planetary scientists, engineers who make instruments for these things. And instead of retreating to their villages and competing with each other, they really worked on big projects that 
spanned these disciplines. And I was talking about what a great culture this was and how, how nice it was that people really listened to each other and supported junior faculty, came to consensus. And one of the visiting committee members said, but you know, to really get to the truth of something, you gotta have some heat, like expect people to pound on the table and stand up and scream at each other until the truth is found. And I thought to myself, I'm really not aware that standing up and pounding on the table and screaming at each other leads to truth. Like, how does that lead to truth? And so I was saying, I was saying, you know, what about junior people or people who don't feel totally part of the club yet? Like they're going to be silenced by this. You'll never hear their version of the truth. And I'm thinking in my head about things like a spacecraft where it's the junior person who is literally soldering the pieces together. And if you don't listen to them when they say there's a problem, you will have a failure in space. And so you never want to silence the, you know, people who don't seem like they're the most senior people. And his response was, unless people are really emotionally invested, you're not going to get to the real answer because no one's caring enough and you need people to yell and scream when there's a disagreement. And so I disagreed with that intensely and I still do. I do not think that yelling and screaming is the way to truth, but there's a big part of the world that thinks that it is, that you have to stand up and really argue other people to a standstill. So, <laughs> man. I'm sure you've seen it happen, right? We've all seen it happen. Oh, sure. Well, in all kinds of uh, settings, right? Yeah. Not just the office. That's right. With the sprint, the, the second six months of the 12-month sprint of, of Psyche. Are you keeping yourself well? Are, are you keeping focused on all of those things as well as the, the actual NASA meat of the thing? Yeah, that's that's really the central question of my existence right now that you just asked me. Because <laughs> I just realized, uh, you know, I mean, I love the work that I do. I love working in university organization as well as in the, the actual science research and the NASA mission, like I love all this stuff. And I and I worked very hard of my own choice. You know, graduate students say, I never want to do this if I have to work that hard, but it, I'm working this hard by my own choice. I don't have to do all these things. There's no part of my job that requires I do all the things that I'm doing, I do it out of joy. And, uh, and yet about a month ago, I realized I really had hit some level of burnout and I didn't even really know what that meant, but suddenly I discovered there were things I just didn't want to say yes to. And I would get a request in on email and I would feel angry instead of curious. And I thought, hmm. so, so your question is a really central one. And, um, and so really I'm focusing on Psyche now and I'm doing relatively less of the day to day in interplanetary initiative and running big questions and things, but we have a fantastic team here led by my deputy director, Jessica Rousset, who's um, fantastic. And we have great faculty associate directors. And so luckily I don't have to do as much of that because I need to stop working on every weekend. <laughs> I need to I need to get that extra balance. I've been very good about um, lots of walking and jogging and all those other things that kind of help you clear your head. But it is actually in the end not possible to do all the things at once. And so now I'm really going to be focusing more on psyche. And it's um, the way this team runs is so fascinating to me. And I'm learning more every day because, of course, I don't know all the things. And I probably have 25 standing meetings every week. And then when little emergencies come up, of course, there's more. And if we're having trouble with one of the hardware builds, you go to weekly meetings on it, and then you go to daily meetings on it. And so pretty soon you have five meetings a week on one subsystem. So, um, uh, but we're making it, which is great. I mean, the team's amazing. Wow. Well, I don't want to be too reductive, but it sounds like uh, teamwork is the way forward for, for at, at your local level and science in general. It's the only way, you know, I mean, uh, not only, obviously, do I not know all the things about how to build a spacecraft, to say the least, but, but I mean, so many of the problems that we're trying to approach in today's world cannot be understood completely by any single person. You know, we have outgrown the age where, like, you're not Lord Kelvin, you can't discover new chemistry in your kitchen, probably, by yourself. You know, we've gotten to this point where, uh, this amazing point, actually, in, in human evolution, where the things we're trying to build or solve cannot be understood by a single person. They have to be done in teams. And so, um, I mean, if I could do it all myself, wouldn't that be fun, but also impossible. So. Thank goodness so many people are interested in working on it. Well, thanks for the conversation today. I really enjoyed having you on. 
I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for your great questions and the chance to talk about these projects. This has been Inside Science Conversations. I'm Chris Gorski. Please like and subscribe and check out our next episode.